options when they said, now I want a homeless bill. So 2000, I think 2004, 2005, we wrote the Homeless Act, the original one that started providing funding to the counties. And so doing the research about what was being done in other areas. Now, this is an issue that's been around for a long time and we're still dealing with today, but I've been involved with, with that for that long at the legislative level. And then on the other end of the spectrum, helping to incentivize and provide more affordable housing, which again is still a problem and even more a problem today. So things like providing tax incentives for developers, and, and those have gone through different iterations. Um, and then making sure that our landlord tenant laws are the way they need to be. So you know, we need our landlords to be, to be doing well and to be whole because we need them to provide the rental housing that we need. But on the other hand, we need to make sure that the tenants have protections so that their rents aren't increased to the point where they're having to, to move out and then good luck finding something they can afford and making sure that you know, they were giving the correct information about you know, lead, for example, or mold. So really enjoy delving into those issues and love the nonpartisanship part of that. I mean, right now it's just gotten so partisan that we're not listening to each other. And I think both sides are equally to blame for this. And I think one of the things that I bring to city council and hopefully to county council as well is my experience working. Like when I went to the legislature, you weren't allowed to express at all what you were. I couldn't even have a yard sign for anybody because you had to just be that impartial and, and make sure both, both sides trusted that you were gonna work for the best policy. And that's you know, how I've approached city council as well. We all know what each other are <laughs> in terms of parties, but when you really think about these issues that are facing our communities today, they should not be partisan. We all want the same things in terms of safe neighborhoods that we can walk or send our kids out in. We all want a healthy environment. Now, some of us maybe have more of a passion for that than others, but we all, I think, understand that the air we breathe and the water we drink, I mean, we all need that. And we all need you know, healthy soils for our food. This is, this is affecting all of us. Um, traffic is not a partisan problem. Parking is not a partisan issue. So I think when we can break it down and really listen to each other, we can make sure that we are taking into account all of the perspectives and we're coming up with the best policy that people can really buy into. Because if you're jamming it down somebody's throat because you can, because you have the majority, you have the power, then there's a whole group of people that are defensive, and left out, and are pushing back, and are not joining in and being part of, of that solution. So I always like to talk about the nonpartisan part of it. Unfortunately, county council is partisan. So we get into a little bit of that push and pull with that, which which is unfortunate, but one of the things that the current county council has been doing, and Derek Young in particular, who's the person that I'm working to replace because he's terming out and he asked me to run. I always like to say I'm not, not running against Derek. One of the things he's been really good at is, so the Democrats have majority for the first time in like 17 years, but they've been really careful to make sure that one of the three Republicans has a leadership role, has two leadership roles actually, so they're really trying to make an effort to make sure that everybody feels included. So I guess that's a little bit about my background volunteer wise. I, I love being involved. I really have a heart for service. That's what gets me up in the morning. I'm not super money focused. I, I haven't ever been. I love knowing that I've made a difference and leaving a legacy. So some of the things you might be involved with is communities and schools. I'm on their board. And we're looking for volunteers because we really know um, that the data shows that children need a trusted adult. So it's not just tutoring. If you're not good at math, that's okay. A lot of these kids just need somebody to talk to. And as you're talking to them, we learn a lot about them and their families. And then we can go in and help their families with all sorts of things like housing and bedding and food and clothes and, and a lot of social emotional support that, that I think all kids are needing right now. Um, another thing that I'm really passionate about is in the environment and land conservation. So hopefully we can talk a little bit about that. I just launched the Gig Harbor Land Conservation Fund, and we're working on conserving 40 acres in downtown Gig Harbor. Um, but the fund actually covers the entire Gig Harbor and Key Peninsula area. So we're always looking out for really good land that's critical habitat, um, especially if it has a sand and stream in it, but really any kind of critical habitat. Or if it's land 
close to some of these denser neighborhoods to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be able to walk to nature and have that respite and have that shade or or have fun within the within the trees. Um, we live in such an amazing area that we don't want to lose that aesthetically, but environmentally, it's so important as well. So just a couple of things that we've been working on at the city council, and then I might might open it up to questions because I can continue to talk about the county and, and all of that. But some of the things I thought you guys might be interested in um, from city council is we've made a lot of progress on our parks. I was on the parks commission for four terms before I joined city council. So it's a passion area of mine. You probably heard that we opened the community paddler dock, which took forever. So this is open to everybody. If you want to bring your paddle board or your kayak, or you've got friends visiting, it's a safer dock because um, it's low profile for getting into the water. And that's at Anson's Park. And we're going to be building the commercial fishing home for pier there as well, which is just going to be really cool because when I first came to the apartment and drove down the hill, I was from New England, and I saw the fishing boats out there. It's like this is where I want to live, and it's so important that we keep our commercial fishing industry going. So we're excited to partner with them on that. Trails like the Cushman Trail, sidewalks. We finally got Peacock Hill sidewalks on our list. It was so funny at the last study session. It's not officially on, but I was like, I've been asking this for three years. Like, what list does it need to go on? Because there's it's always about some list. So we're working on connectivity so people can walk and bike. Um, all sorts of pedestrian crossings, especially the light ones. We're working on that a lot. Um, if you know anything about the history of Gate Harbor, we were the site of the second largest Tulalip village in their whole nation. I knew we had a presence. I didn't know it was that important. So the 40 acres I talked about conserving downtown at, at Donkey Creek, which is also called North Creek, that was their original village site, Tulalip. So we've done a lot with them lately, um, within the last year, renaming the whole estuary to Tualcott Estuary. And we, well, we named Swiftwater School after the Swabosh people, that's the English translation. And we're recognizing Indigenous People Day and Native American History Month. It just, it almost just got silly, but the extent to which we were collaborating with them, but it's just that we had so much to catch up on because people had no idea that we had this history and we really want to celebrate our whole history. So, Traffic, if you guys want to talk about traffic, I'm happy to talk about traffic. Well, I'm not really happy to talk about traffic, but I can. The roundabout is opening. I keep hearing that, but then I keep trying to go through and it's not, but hopefully this week. Um, and then affordable housing. We know that affordable housing is an issue in the Gate Harbor area, so we've joined an affordable housing coalition, and we're going to be looking at ways that we can add affordable housing in Gate Harbor. Because, you know, the people that work in our restaurants or work in our shops, can't afford to live here and our public transit is not good. So we've got people trying to come from Tacoma or trying to come from Bremerton and well, it's pretty much impossible if you don't have a car. So all of these issues are, are intertwined. So I guess, you know, maybe I'll open it up to questions and, and then if I don't get any, I can talk about more Kelly stuff. Yes. I'd love to hear what you have to say about the sports complex. Okay, so the question for people online, if there's anybody, is um, what I have to say about the sports complex. So, a very contentious issue in town right now, which was surprising to the council because for years and years and years, all we ever heard was support for the sports complex. I was on the Parks Commission, oh gosh, through, through all of this, and actually wrote the recommendation to council for moving forward with the sports complex. Now, these, these issues, or these projects, I should say, we will have a vision, but they change a lot over time. And there's three phases of the sports complex, phase one, two, and three. Two, just so you know, is the Little League fields. So it's already fields. It's just a matter of reorienting and creating um, a better layout so that we can accommodate more, more kids. And if you're over there, it's just crazy, crazy busy. So right now, um, the sports complex, we just approved a contract maybe about a month ago for them to start doing some, some studies and some preliminary design, which seems crazy because I thought we had a design you know, four or five years ago. So they're gonna do a traffic study. They're gonna do an environmental study. I know there's folks in town that feel like it's not going far enough. And we're gonna be having those discussions at the study session 
this Thursday, I think. So you're all welcome to, it's on Zoom because you know, COVID seems to be coming back. And our study sessions actually are staying on Zoom for a little bit. So you're welcome to weigh in because I have questions. I've been meeting with um, some of my friends at Heron's Key about the extent of these studies and whether it takes into consideration just phase one or if we can look at additional phases as more of a cumulative study. But that's where we're at. So we're going to be answering some of the questions. There was a petition that was circulated. And so you know what I've asked staff, I, I haven't seen this yet. I'm like, we can't just be silent on this at this point. We've gotten all this feedback from the community. We need to respond. Here's, here is what we are doing. You know, some of it may not go as far as, as the folks that signed the petition wanted. Some, some things may be exactly what they're asking for. I certainly hope so. And then you're always welcome to continue to provide public feedback. I know it's really hard to see the loss of trees, especially kind of in Gig Harbor. I mean, I remember when Gig Harbor North was all trees, right? And we were all, it's just like one day they were, they were all gone or a lot of them were gone. We still had some of these stands. Um, but with the growth management, act, you guys have heard of that, every community has growth targets that we have to meet. And this was the area of town where, where we had the land and the topography fit to add the housing that we had to by, by law in every community that plans under the growth management act has to, has to take on some density in the city so that we prevent sprawl into the rural areas. And because we had so many new people in the Gate Harbor North area, and we had so many young families, that's when we started hearing more and more about the need for local fields for them to practice on. So this was the response. Um, one thing that I will say is that I mentioned there's three phases. I would hope, I don't know if I should even say this, but I would really hope that once we get phase one and two done, we can take another look at whether we actually need phase three so that we can maybe maintain the forest as trails or something like that for phase three. And then just the other thing that I like to, to mention just for perspective is that phase one was the site of a commercial complex. So that was supposed to be raised and it was supposed to be you know, more big box stores or medical facilities or something. So the city purchased it and really well thought a better use and a more palatable use for the community would be a park. So it's an improvement, but not as far as some folks would like in terms of just leaving it natural. Do you have a follow-up? Well, I was just going to say, I think one of the, the, of course, the environmental concern is huge. And, yeah. and the fact that um, the pros plan, when, when that was developed, the urban forests were important. And the survey indicated that sports facilities were way down on the list of what the public wanted. The public really wanted walking trails and that kind of thing. So that environmental, the thought of taking out a place where there are 90 different species of birds is hurtful. Um, but even more concerning is the traffic impact. Yeah. Because right now, as we found out with the harbor closure, there were times that it took me from here to go to the freeway, 30 minutes to get to the freeway, and there's no emergency access on Shorty Boulevard for emergency vehicles. Mm -hmm. Well, the proposed six soccer fields would bring in who knows how many people on a weekend for a tournament. And they're talking about tournaments with many teams because it's regional. Well, I think it should be community, not yes. regional. It's the whole other thing. And that's something I'm asking. I'm asking as well. I, when I when I emailed them just the other day, I said, and, so I don't remember when we talked about this at a parks commission level. I never remember um, hearing about like the term regional because we just heard there was so much need for local practice and right. playing fields. So I would love, and I can't promise anything, but I'd love to get that term regional removed. And then there, if we built out all six phases or all three phases, there would be six fields, but Phase one is just two fields, and phase two, I assume, is two fields as well. And that's at the point where I would like to say, okay, let's pause. Traffic is, is a concern, and so we're going to hear about that at this study session, but traffic reporting is bad. I mean, I'm traveling it just like you have. And I, I can see the, the people in the Cormac Creek area are being really impacted by this mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the, the traffic access. It's really not. 
you know, parking right right now. So there's a yeah. league game on Saturday. Traffic is having to park in the neighborhood because there's not enough. Parking. Oh yeah, I was just there. I was just there this weekend dropping something off. But yeah, they I saw people circling through the neighborhood. So it is. So I'm I'm happy to hear that you think maybe that there be some revision. It's the uh, I think that that it. It can affect not only North Bay Harbor, but the whole harbor. Because if you have traffic, it's going to impact downtown yep. the harbor as well as up here in the north. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about ways that that we can mitigate what we can and so maybe using the school fields. Yeah, a lot of people talk about that and and, and I've asked for some some more information at the study session about about schools because we've talked to the schools, they are already using the schools. I know sometimes it's like, well, I don't see anybody using Swiftwater. So I asked about that. So again, hopefully we'll get some more information. But these, these, I mean, I remember when my kids were a little playing stuff, when we were at Artvale or we were over um, behind Discovery. They they really are using the schools already. We don't we don't want to take down trees where, where we don't have to. And it's wonderful that the community and some members of the community have mobilized around this because. Once we do have phase one and two done, I think we'll have those voices to say, okay, let's let's take a pause and assess. Do we really need more? Or with the community, the kids included, you know, would they prefer to have you know, forests in their neighborhood where they can walk around and play and enjoy? Thank you for that. Yes. Related to that, uh, I live on the Deep Peninsula. Uh -huh. and the concern there is besides housing. That's a bigger concern. But uh, security uh, and the parking lots and the parks. Mm -hmm. So I hike uh, or walk at 360 Mill Park. Um, I use the park my car on, on 144. Numerous car breaks and break yeah. it. It's true also Maple, uh, Maple Hollow, which is more isolated. Mm -hmm. it's true. People won't even go to the 480, what used to be called the 480 Park, uh, because of numerous car breaks, break ins. Does this apply to all the parks in the big car barrier? Yeah. <laughs> Security issues and set down number two is what can we do about it? Okay, so we have the same issues here in the city with the Cushman Trail. And you would think that there's so much visibility and there's so much traffic. So that parking lot right there next to Home Depot, you know, right on Morgan, break ins all the time. And I had a friend that accessed the park over by the McCormick Creek neighborhood. And her window is broken out. And I mean, these are pretty visible, well trafficked areas. And I know there's a lot of issues out on the Key Peninsula. So, with the Key Peninsula, that's your Key Peninsula Parks District. Yeah, yeah. And Tracy, the executive director, is wonderful there. And they've got a volunteer coordinator, I forget his name, but they're trying to get like park hosts or park stewards to basically hang out in the parking lot and keep an eye on things. Um, over here in the city, we've got cameras. Of course, we can't cover everything, but up by the Home Depot one, we've got cameras and we're just telling people to be safe and, and don't have their purses out and, and view. Personally, when I go to the Krishna Trail, I more likely to park at the Home Depot and put the big light open and then just walk over because I don't have time to have my car, you know, broken into and windows smashed out. And um, here in Gate Harbor, since you've touched a little bit on public safety, we have an excellent police department. We have 20 officers right now. We've been trying to get to 21, and it seems like we're almost there, and somebody retires or somebody moves on. So I actually um, emailed the, the chief a couple weeks ago. Like, Maybe we should be shooting for 22 or 23, and then we'll land at 21. So they are fantastic about responding. They respond to every single call. So if you're in the city, you're in really good shape. We've got a decent number per capita, you know, of police officers. The county is a completely other story. So our deputies, we're, we're a rural detachment. So there's Peninsula, there is a mountain detachment, and there's the, oh gosh, the other one, Flat Hills or something, some other detachment. So the county sheriff department is already really low on officers, so over 50, and they're expecting another 50 to just be lost because other departments pay more or people are just you know, retiring out of the field. And when they do have officers, they really concentrate them in the areas of highest crime, which makes sense, which is their central district. So you're Spanaway and you're Fredrickson. And 
in that area. So that means that out here at any time, we usually only have two deputies. And that's the entire Meek Harbor Peninsula, Fox Island, and the entire Key Peninsula. So it's amazing that we see them at all. And, and it's not that they're not trying, but they are obviously having to respond to violent crimes, you know, the highest priority crimes. So if you have a property theft or if you have vandalism, it's, they may not even respond or it's going to take them a lot of time. And I do want to encourage people to still report. There's a reporting online and, and when you call the police, you call 911, they will direct you how to do that because then we can show where we have crime and where we have pockets of crime. So hopefully we can justify another deputy in the future. And I don't want to give unrealistic expectations because we're pretty far down on the list because even though we've got a lot of crime out here, it's a lot worse in the other areas. And I hate to even say that because it doesn't feel like that out here, but, but that's the case. And our deputies are, are working as hard as they can. There's actually a meeting tonight on the Key Peninsula at six. I'm not sure if it's at the, the Civic Center probably about crime because there's people, people are frustrated. And I think what we're trying to remind folks is that, that our deputies and our officers are, are having to respond to those priority violent crimes. And that unfortunately, the property crimes are, are, are being delayed. But if we can really get a handle on the violent crimes, then hopefully they can start responding more to the not lesser crimes, but the property crimes that are not a matter of, of life and death. And we're really encouraging people. Key Peninsula has um, some great neighborhoods that are involved in this Safe Streets program. Neighborhood Watch, Safe Streets, really encouraging people to have eyes on their neighborhoods or their, their streets, putting the ring cameras up is good because that helps our, our law enforcement to, and hopefully will we'll cause some folks to pause, you know, and, and think before they decide that we're easily preyed upon. Yes? Oftentimes we hear the class to talk about controlling this. Is there any uh, movement uh, to get at the causes Yes, yes. So the question was, we talk a lot about, you know, addressing like the crisis or controlling the violence or stopping the violence and what about prevention? I met with the new Tacoma Police Chief, Chief Moore, like a month ago, who I really like, I have a lot of hope for, they're experiencing a lot of crime in Tacoma. And he said that he thinks at its root is a lack of love in people's lives. Kids, teenagers, and then moving on up, they, if they don't have what they need in terms of that social emotional connection, in terms of food, in terms of clothing, in terms of social interaction, you know, that, that experience with a trusted adult, usually a teacher or a coach or maybe a club leader, then that's where these law enforcement professionals are believe, and, and I do too, people start, they start losing hope. They start losing hope that they can have a successful life based on kind of the, the correct path. Maybe they don't feel like they can be successful in school or college or a business. So they're like, well, then I'm going to make my money over here this way by, by stealing something or getting involved with drugs. And of course, that just spirals. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about and our current county council has been passionate about, Derek Young has been a real leader in this, is a lot of early childhood investment. So he started a birth of five coalition they started this thing called Help Me Grow, which provides families a lot of resources. So if you call in and maybe or identify a family that needs help, they'll go visit the family. They'll help them work through mental health issues, a lot of early intervention. They'll get them connected with programs like communities and schools or children's home society or food backpacks for kids to help get these kids and their families, because you know the family has to have what they need too, the housing or, or the assistance they need so that so that the kids feel safe and secure and have that sense of hope that that they can also be on the right path and be successful in life and so we don't want to just focus on on the crises homelessness is another example of that and that's another thing i think that this current county council is doing right is they're investing a ton of money in actual housing so the crisis getting people off of the sidewalks and at least into maybe the sanctioned encampment area where there's services and sanitation and lots of case management to then start moving them into a tiny home or one of the single room occupancy dwellings 
or maybe a lot of people they just need rent subsidy subsidies. We found that a lot of homeless people, especially in their cars, we were talking about this earlier, but even in the tents, they actually have jobs, but they can't afford an apartment. So sometimes it's just a matter of getting them over that gap so that they can access an apartment with first and last month's rent and maybe a couple months of subsidy, and then they're on their way. They're good. Now there's a lot, there's a lot of cases that are harder cases too. Folks that have been out on the street so long that they've developed you know, severe mental illness. Some of that's from substance abuse over time. And we find that people get you know, more heavily involved in substance abuse when they're on the streets because, for example, they get hooked on meth because they're trying to stay up all night to watch their stuff. And it just spirals. So having people in a safe place where we can address those issues is important. That's kind of like the immediate crisis. But again, just like crime, we need to work on preventing homelessness and stemming that pipeline of new people coming in. So whether that's rent assistance or, or um, eviction prevention, helping folks with job training. So if they're not making enough to maintain their, their apartment, well, how about you know, getting them into a welding program or a CNC program or you know a CNA program or something that will raise their income level so that they have what they need to be stable because we know that's going to help them and it's going to help their whole family. So we're really starting to to curb that cycle of poverty that is rampant. So we have to attack it on both ends. And, and it's hard politically because what people want to see is the immediate quick fix. And we do have to fix what's going on right now, absolutely. But we need to also be working on the root causes because while we may not see the, see the results right now, that's what's important for our future. Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for your service. Oh, um, our democracy depends on people getting involved and in, in giving of themselves, which it sounds like you really do. I really think that. Thank you. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Communities for Schools or something yeah. like what? What is that? So Communities and Schools is a nonprofit organization that I've been involved in communities in schools. Yes, it's actually a national organization, but we have a local chapter here for the Peninsula School District. And if you're looking for a volunteer opportunity, it's just wonderful. I think we're in 10 of the schools right now. And we've got these site coordinators that are in there working with kids that are at risk, right? Kids that they may be low income or they may be experiencing other, maybe it's a social thing. Maybe it's a kid that is having trouble making friends on the playground. And if you're a parent, you know, nothing breaks your heart more than that. I've never even cared how my kids did academically. I want them to be happy, right? <laughs> So it's getting in there and figuring out what these kids need, um, but we also then figure out what we can do to help the families. During COVID, I mean, there were some positive things that came out of COVID. When the schools shut down, we were going to these kids' houses. We've never been to these kids' houses. We found out that in the entire house, for some of these kids, there was one mattress that they were sharing. Some kids were living with the grandmother in like some dilapidated trailer, while the mother and the boyfriend and the new baby are high on meth in the other trailer, some didn't have running water. I mean, we had, but the good thing is now we know. And so we're like, oh my gosh, we can connect them with these other services. We found compounds of families that were, I mean, doing their best, right? To, to survive and depend on each other, but some of them didn't speak English. And when we were able to really make that connection with them, we're like, okay, we can, we can get you all these different services and assistance and get people out there cleaning up these places. And so it's just wonderful. What we're looking for for volunteers, not to overwhelm people, is mentors. Just somebody to go into the schools to talk with kids, to read with the kids, to do math with the kids if math is your thing. Um, but more important, it's that connection that this person, this young person, has somebody they can talk to. And you know, especially when they get into the middle school and, and high school ages, I know, they don't want to talk to their parents. It happens, I don't get it. But I even remember when I was a teenager, I was my choir director, right? So sometimes you need that person that's just a little bit removed that can be the voice of reason and wisdom. So if you're interested, you know, come see me because our volunteers, of course, with COVID went down and now we're trying to build this back up. Yes. So what's happening with the, I mean, communities and schools got a barrel of money from yes. Kinsey. McKinsey Scott, yes. Yeah. And so, uh, is Game Harbor getting any of that funding? I mean, I think they are. Yeah. What's going to happen to that one? Yes, well, good question. Um, 
hopefully I don't over speak because I think we still are, are working through our board you know, officially, but hmm, let's see what I can say. So I don't want to over say. So the local, your local communities and schools affiliate, the one that I'm on the board of, received $800,000 from Mackenzie Scott. And she was very selective about who she chose because she wanted to see, you know, organizations that were fiscally responsible and that were making a big difference. So we were honored. We didn't apply for this. We had no idea it was even out there. It was, it was a big shock. So she wants impact, obviously, and then she wants sustainability, which we really appreciate. And if you've been involved in nonprofit organizations, you appreciate how important that is. So that represents about one year of our budget because, you know, staff is obviously the biggest part of our budget. So what we're talking about now, and we'll be deciding at the board meeting this, this week, is do we go into one school or two schools to additional schools to serve more kids? And I'm going for the two because we want to show, you know, that we can have more of an impact and we know I think schools are discovering the Harbor High. We want that continuum of when kids are going to elementary, middle, and high school and they've got They've got support and the families have support. But we also are thinking about um, sustainability because this is a one-time gift. And you know, this will last us for a few years, but then we're gonna have to figure out where the money comes from to keep the people employed, to keep you know the services to the kids going. So we're weighing all of those options, but it's been a, it's been a wonderful way for us to be able to expand our services into other schools that we weren't expecting. Um, and then another cool thing that happened about it is we got such good publicity and people were like, oh my gosh, this organization is, has so much legitimacy and it can be trusted. Kitsap School District came to us and wanted us to put one of our people, one of our site coordinators at Kitsap High School. And you've probably heard it's like one of the biggest high schools in the state. Mm -hmm. Is it the biggest? It's enormous. And the principal, as well as the superintendent, both came from Peninsula School District, so they knew about us already. And they said we will pay the full thing. So because we're like, well, we can't, we we can't afford to put another site for here. They're paying the whole bill for the person. And we imagine that that you know after a year or so, hopefully we can expand into more of those schools, the most needy schools for the kids in that area too. So we're really excited about that. There's a lot of work to be done and a lot of great organizations out there out there doing it. We're very big into partnerships. So whether it's the Red Barn or Food Backpacks for Kids or Fish Food Bank or Children's Home Society. The Mustard Seed Project is awesome. You guys are talking about housing. So important for people on the Key Peninsula. So when I talk to people that are getting older on the Key Peninsula, they're like, we can't handle this house anymore. We don't want this house anymore. It's too much land for us. But we don't want to leave the KP. People in the Key Peninsula, that is really key for. And now the mustard seed is providing a place where they can stay close to their families. Because what we found is when people have had to go to Lakewood, or even as far as New Harbor, their neighbors aren't visiting as often. Their family isn't visiting. Everybody has great intentions, but they're busy lives. And you know what happens when your social world shrinks? It's not, not good, not good health-wise or mental-wise. And, and we want to take care of our wonderful people and, and keep them in their communities if, if they want to stay, which most of them do. Anything else? Some people ask, um, what the county does different from the city. I get that a lot, especially from city residents. So I just wanted to mention a few of the things we've talked about, some of them. So unfortunately, criminal justice is the biggest part of the county budget. So while you have, you know, we've got our sheriff department, but we also have all the jails, right? So Gay Harbor and all the other cities utilize our jails. Um, we have the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office. And one of the things that this current county council is doing really well is developing new innovative um, paths for people to go through the judicial system because you know, some people, if they're experiencing some mental health issues, just throwing them in jail or booking them and charging them and putting them back on the streets isn't helping. They're just going to recidivate again through the system. So they created just recently a mental health court is great there's a drug court there's a family court because we don't want kids to be separated from their parents that's like the last resort so we want a place where they can really work through those issues and then drug court of course it's much better we can get people into into treatment 
Um, we have the health department, which was pretty important the last couple of years. Um, affordable housing is something that we're working really hard on. I mentioned the environment. They've got a sustainability 2030 plan. So they're really working hard on the environment. And th these are some of the things that we want to make sure move forward. Um, the current council has had the majority for the last two years. They've got a lot of great things in place and they're just starting to implement these things. So we want to make sure that we're moving forward. Did you have a question? I thought I saw your hand up. No, no, okay. I do have a yeah, question. Okay. I think it's under the county jurisdiction. Uh, I repeatedly received uh, jury duty notices about two a year. Oh, so really? Long. You're popular. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I turn them down and I usually get down. That's accepted. The issue, and that's what I told them, is living here in the Key Peninsula, especially on the first day of the week on Monday, the drive is early in the morning. The winter in the dark, in the rain, in commute traffic, the situation here at the courthouse where parking is impossible. And yeah. And then you then you, you finally are allowed to go into the jury room. It's packed in there. It's hot, no ventilation, no seats. Uh, is there any way to improve that whole system? Not only that, uh, I'd be glad to serve. On, on the jury, but not in Tacoma. Uh, I think Big Harbor has a whole court system. We do. That whole, to me, for a person who was retired in the 70s, that system is just too difficult. Yeah, I, I don't have a solution for you, but that that's something to consider because one of the things that I would like to do is see more services out here at the site of Bridge for that reason. Especially in the Key Peninsula, where it's difficult for folks to drive. I mean, if you need to get a permit or something, you have to go all the way to Tacoma. It would be nice if at least once a month, our planning and permitting people could come out here for a day and be there at Key Center. Um, our, and the health department is already coming out, but they were just doing like septic and environmental health issues. It would be nice to have somebody from the Health and Human Service Agency to help people with rent assistance forms and, and things like that and to access other services. Um, so the judicial is something to look into and I don't, I don't see why that would be impossible. We do have court in Geek Harbor, but I don't think it's a jury court. But maybe that's something that we can add because I think that that's a good point. Yeah. Or a bus. Yeah, yeah, or help with transportation. Awesome. Yeah, send it to send somebody else to fetch you. Yeah. Does anybody want to talk about safe parking? Because I know that's something that you all are interested in here. Yes. So, and I'm not the expert on this, but um, right now, from what I understand, churches are allowed to have safe parking. The current county council tried to get that expanded to other entities, businesses, or community groups, um, and the executive struck it down. He vetoed it. And to override a veto, you have to have five votes. And the county council only had their regular majority of four votes. So on Tuesday, it's going to come back before the county council. Um, the four, the Democrats are going to try again. It's going to be a watered down version of it, but they're hoping that something they can get through. From what I understand, it's going to be more of a limited like pilot program. So churches, again, are fine to have their own programs. But I think they're going to see if they can get up to four other entities out in the county. And to me, this is low hanging fruit in terms of things that we can do to address the homelessness issue. We know that most people that are homeless in their cars, um, gosh, there's so much to this. They typically have tried the shelters and found them dangerous, don't want their kids, you know, they don't, they don't want to be there. A lot of times, because they have a car, they're still employed, but they just can't access affordable housing. When I was interviewing with the Tacoma firefighters two weeks ago, they were telling me that they, this woman showed up in a van in their parking lot and they went out and talked to her. She had just gotten a job at Amazon, you know, in the warehouse, but she didn't have the money saved up for an apartment. And these guys were like, you know what? You're good. You stay here. I'm not sure it's not legal, but you know, they, were, they, were, they helped her. They would bring food out, you know, just make sure to keep an eye out for things. They're like, one day she was gone. And then a couple weeks later, she showed back up and let them know that she'd been able to find out. When Denny and I went out to Puyallup, we heard about they had great results with people moving into housing. And a lot of these folks, I think they said 80%, had 
find jobs. They were going to Home Depot or they were going to Walmart, but they needed a place that was safe to park at night, to have their stuff in their car. I mean, kind of have some control over their lives still. And there were showers and there was you know, laundry that would come through and, and the case management was there. I found it really interesting because you hear a lot of people say, oh, these people don't want help. You know, they're, they're, first of all, that, that's not true. There's a lot of folks that are ready to take help. Even if you hear the statistics, which kills me, that only half accept these services. I'm like, well, A, that's a lot of people. That's half of the people off the street. So this is a good thing. <laughs> but then the other half, what Jenny and I heard from the service provider, was that yes, they get people that are like, no, I want to fill out a form. I don't want, I don't want your help. I just want a place to park. Well, they have to fill out a form. There are there are some things that, that they require. But they really ease people into this so that this one gentleman, for example, that we're talking about, felt safe and you know, kind of calmed down. He had a place where he could park and no one was going to come and hassle him or move him along. And then, like, after a couple weeks, he started getting to know people little by little. You know, didn't want to at first, but started to get to know the case managers there. And after a couple weeks, started accepting services, started accepting meals, started talking about you know, what else he could apply for and how they could help him. So some people you know, are at the point where they're just so beaten down and they've had so much trauma that yeah, they, they're pretty closed off to services. But if you can get them in a place where they can stabilize and feel safe, then most, I think, are, you know, we've, we've seen, are, they start opening up to services and they start seeing the possibilities. They start seeing a little bit of hope. Yes, I could get into housing. Yes, I could. Get employed again if I'm not. I could reconnect maybe with siblings or family and, and start building that support network again. So hopefully on Tuesday this, this passes through again. Um, thank you guys for, for doing what you're doing. And we always like to say, you know, every entity that provides safe parking can come up with its own rules. You can say that they have to be gone by 7 a.m. and they can't go back till 5 or there's only a certain number or you can come up with your own rules about who you serve and, and how you serve them. But when I heard about the veto, which is so frustrating because when I'm knocking on doors in Tacoma, for example, people are so upset about somebody parking in front of their house. They're so upset about somebody parking at the park or down by the river where honestly they're just going to the bathroom. No bathroom, so environmental like it's horrible all around, right? They're really upset about that. So now we have a situation where a, a good group of people want to wants to organize something, the sanitation for these folks to have a place to go. Why would we say no to that? If we do, the cars are gonna be in front of these houses again, and that's that's not good for anybody. So we'll we'll see. Yes, so I have a kind of related question to that. Is there is a uh, horrible shortage of psychiatric beds yeah. in Pierce County, particularly for young yes. children and young adults. Is there anything that on the works to yes. address that issue? Yes, yeah, so Pierce County was the only county in the entire state of Washington that did not have a behavioral health tax up until last year when this county council passed the behavioral health tax. It's like one tenth of one percent. So it's like a penny out of every ten dollars or something. And again, every other county had it. So we are way behind the curve. And Pierce County has terrible mental health and substance use statistics because of that. But at least they got it passed. They just released the first grants. I think they had about $10 million. It adds up really quickly. Um, and there's, they're going to provide more beds, more facilities, more services. Now there is a problem. It's a problem that a lot of industries are, are facing. There's not enough people. So even if we've got the money, it's a challenge to find providers. Um, and the county will say that around homelessness too, that we've got the money. We need, we need places like this. We need, we need partners to, to support, to do the actual services. So I would also like to really explore, how are we building our pipeline of mental health and behavioral health professionals? Talking to high schoolers, talking to college students about this is a career that you know, can help a lot of people and that is very marketable. So it's going to take a little time for us to, to get up there, but we go more resources. Yes, Penny. Yeah, what do you know about the status of the old state hospital down in uh, Lakewood? Where, you know, I've dealt with that for years. I'm curious to know where that stands now in the facilities that are available. Yeah, you know what? I, you probably know more about it than I do, Jenny. <laughs> I, I hear a lot about it. 
Um, I actually don't know what the future is for that. But a lot of people blame that for the problem. So they just left people out and then there was nothing, nowhere for them to go. Not just the problem, it's just that there was, uh, there was an extent where uh, there's an availability of buildings there for housing for homeless. And of course, we tried to do it for the vets several years ago and totally got shot down all across the board. And I, but it's been damn near is uh, Bruce is, you know, he, he looked at it when he first came on and everything. And I don't know where he stands for any of this now. You guys, if yeah, it's ever know. talked about at council, you know, if I'll ask about that. You talk about it. You know, at some point, I mean, if you're not there yet, I'm hoping you're going to be there. <laughs> but, I, but I'm still talking to them because they, okay. they won't be there. So I will I will ask for uh, just any time we've got a facility that we can use for homeless right. and yeah. as a place to triage people and get people into better housing, we yeah. need to be looking at that. Based on my experience, I used to be a librarian at Western State Hospital. Oh, wow. Um, apparently, and, you know, I, I hear this secondhand. It's becoming more and more of a forensic hospital. Much of the hospital is now under uh, at least medium security. When I worked there in the 80s, 90s, and, uh, there uh, was no fence, no gates, it was open campus. That's not the case anymore. So the hospital has undergone a lot of changes. Okay. And you know, there may be a need for that as well, but we don't want to criminalize homelessness, so we want to make sure that. that the people feel like they're the place where they belong. But we're looking, we're looking for places. I mean, it's very frustrating that this, and not to blame the city of Tacoma, I'm sure this is not easy, but we need sanctioning campus. We need places for people to stabilize so then we can start working them, working them into real housing situations. And it just doesn't seem like that hard. When a forest fire comes through, he has got a city built overnight. So it just seems like we should be able to do this. We'll work on it. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time. I'm always available for questions about the city or or county, obviously. Um, and you'll be seeing my signs up. And if anybody would like a sign, I would love to put one in your yard. Or if you want any information, um, or just tell your friends and neighbors, and, and they can feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I am really passionate about serving the public. This is, this is what I want to do with my life. And I'm excited to, I'm excited that my kids can fit <laughs> for themselves a little bit so I can do And they're really helpful too. They're, they're really excited about it. Pretty helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Exciting to exciting and vibrant and uh, Candidate, you know, we certainly, I know Ann and I are certainly supporting you and uh, hoping that we're going to have more in the community. So uh, thanks again for your time here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.